He had Just stickers all course. over the machine going, do not home, <laughs> do not home, do not home. <laughs> do not home. <laughs> he used to write G code with a spreadsheet. Yeah. We've never trammed never. a single machine. I, I think We've I'll, never, I'll tra tra never trammed one. I have never trammed no, no, never trammed no machine. I essentially complained about being like, how the heck do I do this? <laughs> and Leighton, when he first gets on there, he's like, so this is incredibly simple. And like, <laughs> The following is a conversation between individuals representing some of the most influential companies as well as content in the CNC world today. It was truly an honor having these men in my shop and I was pleasantly surprised to see the humility that each of them so naturally walked in. That alone is such a rarity and I can confidently say that I was left with a spark of creativity that I've been lacking for quite some time now. I hope that the quality of this conversation will greatly outweigh the quality of the audio that was captured. I'd like to start off with a quote. Great things are done by a series of small things brought together. If you would like to support the channel, you can check out the links in the description below. And without further ado, I hope you enjoy the conversation. We have Ben from Myers Woodshop. We have Rob from Carve Co. We have Morgan, who you might know as the guy from Winfinity. We have Layton, who you might know as the guy who teaches you how to do stuff on Carve Co. And then we have Stone from Winfinity. And this is an incredible opportunity that I thought I would open up with a very specific question. So if anybody knows the answer to this, please raise your hand. All right, who is credited with inventing CNC? Alexander Graham Bell, obviously. False. <laughs> wow. Do uh, you know hey. what's, what? It's gotta be a German guy. Do you know what he invented CNC for? Okay, so oh, wow. it is, this was in, 19, in the 1940s, John T. Parsons is credited to invent the first computer numerical control because they were needing a very efficient and repeatable way to make helicopter blades. That was giving you my second guess. Yep. Yeah. 1940. Wow. Uh, honestly. Parsonsberger, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't know. John T. Parsons. This was the screenshot, uh, so I, I can't even look at it. Anymore. Anymore. <laughs> no. that, doesn't, that, sound, yeah. that doesn't sound very. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, I thought uh, you would have known that late and at your age. I don't know. So, do you after all this, but. So, yeah, I mean, this is going to be uh, super unstructured. Uh, as I've been hanging out with all these guys, I've realized that there is an incredible amount of knowledge when it concerns the CNC space all in my wood shop today and figured that I would let some people on the internet join in because I know some people out there might find this a little bit interesting, but there's no real agenda to this or any purpose behind it, but hopefully I'll enjoy as we strike up some conversations. Um, let's just go ahead and, for the people out there who do not know what CarveCo is, uh, what's CarveCo? What do y'all do? That kind of stuff. Go on, like, so, you, you take this one. So we create software that basically lets you design and machine your ideas send them to the CNC, like the one Finity, and then you can make your parts. Simple enough. There you go, simple. Now the cool thing is that, um, you know, what a lot of people see is they see like the maker side to our business with Carveco. But like we've been doing this for like 30 years now, it's quite a while like, as a software company. Um, but before we got into the maker space, we've kind of sort of had a different market. People may see it. Um, we've got this sort of high-end market, so it's slightly different where people sort of they're more business based stuff so they'll do like for example greetings cards or like coins and things like that or like chocolate molds or jewelry or other things so we've got like this whole other side but the cool thing is is that like it's basically the same software but it's a step down version when you get to maker and maker plus so you kind of work your way up um, from like our maker level all the way up but it's the same design the same sort of tools, it's just more advanced tools the higher up you go. So, you know, when you make something and we see some of the signs you make, then you're like, wow, you can do that cool stuff on the Onefinity, you make these signs. But actually these are the things that like theme parks are using to do the high end stuff as well. So it's kind of quite a cool thing when we see, you know, the stuff that people are making out there. So with, you know, no relative certainty, what percentage of people do you think has, have held an object that was made using your software? Oh, almost everybody. Almost 100%. Almost 100% of the world's population. Yeah. Yeah, that's and that's crazy. probably because they've probably touched a coin at some point. Wow. So if you've touched a coin, then the likelihood are you've, you've touched something that's been designed in our software. If you've eaten a gummy type sweet, yeah. could be made in our software. If you've got somebody a greetings card, probably from our software. 
cake toppers, things like that. It's some quite cool stuff that you don't really see, like that we show on the market. You know, we show a lot of the like Leighton shows all this sort of cutting stuff in wood, cutting signs, and things like that. So, you know, we've got this other part of the business as if well. If you've eaten chocolate. Everyone's so, <laughs> so y'all being here in my wood shop is like the peak of y'all's career. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. It's the highlight. You know, it has been because, because of the people we've got to meet, right? Uh -huh. yeah. And we've had a, an amazing Mexican uh -huh. right, yeah. food today. So uh -huh. for us from the UK, that's that's no, rich. I, say, I love doing stuff like this. This is so much fun. Mm -hmm. um, like, it's just it's really good. I, lo I love meeting people like who are making stuff and everything and talking to them about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just find out so much more stuff than you know just the post on the internet or something. And like you know, the, the amount of stuff that we've talked about today has just been crazy. Yeah, it has. And for y'all out there, it's uh, very intimidating. Um, having both uh, the CNC people and then the CNC software people be in your shop watching you make stuff uh, because I've certainly figured out a lot more simple ways to do the things that I have been doing for years uh, but I also feel like an idiot so uh, I know that a lot of people would pay a lot of money to have this service you know all of them show up in their their shop and uh, they test cheap. them <laughs> What's cool is hearing like from, from me just starting out probably where you were years ago is that I just saw a machine that could do something cool and since I love technology I was like I need, I need to have one. I don't have a clue what I'm going to make but I need to have one and it's taken me to a place where like I have made one thing I can recall is somebody reached out to me on Etsy to make uh, something that I didn't know what I was making and it ended up being for DreamWorks. Uh, they, the <laughs> artists do a storyboard and they have like this square that they put down to kind of frame what 16 by 9 and stuff. And I made that. And then hearing you saying that, you know, Carveco is made from making things I'm using every day that I don't expect, like holding uh, money, to where I'm using software that can scale up to whatever. Like, what is my potential in the future to make? I've, I've gained a skill unknowingly to where I can start doing a, you know, a profession I would have never imagined, which is super cool that anybody can start out. We're in the age that anybody and, can do it. And having a profession, that's your hobby. It's yeah. something that you're really passionate about. Absolutely. Like, that's just like everybody's dream really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A workshop like this. Yeah. <laughs> like you walk into the workshop and it's like, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just so simple because like the, the machines themselves are extremely simple, but y'all have put them together very, very well to the point where somebody like me, who I've got a lot of experience with woodworking, but I get very frustrated because the average consumer doesn't understand the amount of work that goes into a piece of a handcrafted item. So they expect me to be able to churn out, you know, 20 of something in an afternoon. When in reality, if you don't have a CNC machine, that's a really difficult thing to do unless you have a ton of jigs and your, your shop is set up purpose built for that one product. And the great thing is with a CNC machine, you just load up a different file. And sure, you might have your own jigs and fixtures on the machines themselves, but these two things right here can absolutely change the course of your business. And honestly, I mean, like, I just wish that I would have been able to get one a lot sooner because I dove so hard into, you know, traditional uh, woodworking. And now that the CNC machines are here, like, I'm like, wow, I'm very happy that I have this big space, but it's not as needed. And what Ben was just saying, like, you get these opportunities and you start making these things and it opens up so many doors. And somebody can think that you're a big, big, big business where you could just be out of your garage using one of these machines. Yeah, most, like, yeah. Most people I know who are a big business are one person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and you don't you don't know that. Or a lot of people who know who who around my town, like, oh, you do woodworking? Can you make stuff? There's a whole bunch of you. There's one guy, and it's on my yeah. free time type yeah. deal. It's not you know, but a, but a machine opens the doors to do a lot more of that. So much. And even if you've got like just a just a wall, it's just a library of different templates, and you know people are expecting you to crank out twenty of like a cutting board or something in an afternoon yeah you can sit there and do that and just grind away at it but um, that's what you're doing that day mm -hmm. you can put something on the CNC while you're working on something else mm -hmm. your machine is taking cutting out the shapes you're cutting out yeah. more you know more material gluing stuff up you know elsewhere in the shop it's, that's why I hate doing tool changes because I can leave a tool running and 
be doing something else. Mm -hmm. If I have to do a tool change, mm -hmm. I need to come back to the machine to change the tool. I'm not doing the other thing that I want to do. Well, then that, but that then that comes in. Um, you in, you take into consideration that part when you're designing. Like you know, I'm, I need to cut this thing. How can I do this with only one bit? Yeah. yeah. You know, and that that's something that you just kind of have to have some foresight and you, you take care of that in the software. But if you can figure out how to cut out a thing that you need and have it mostly done with just one bit, yeah. I mean, it's, it's an incredible type saver. There's something you said earlier when we were cutting today. When the, when the stamps were cutting, you were like, isn't it magical? We just well, I can just watch this machine go all yeah. day. <laughs> I, I've kind of lost that. Wow, I, really? I think it's awesome that you have it. I've kind of lost it. Like I remember <laughs> when, I, <laughs> when I first got my 3D printer and scanner or, you know, 3D, or the laser and the CNC, it was, you would... I wasn't any faster because I was just standing there like a TV and I lost that. And, and, but some of these things were like, I've lost the challenge of myself because I'm not cranking out a ton of stuff. But like, seeing like, oh, here's a problem. You guys were making stamps. I like to watch them make, how can, now I'm like invested and now I'm like, ooh, how can I make, if I, if I can make the toolpath better than you, that's a challenge, that's cool. But learning that step, like, it, you know, now you're at the point where how can I design this without a tool change? Well, in the beginning, I was like, I'm, I'll do a hundred tool change. I'm just, this is awesome. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? So it's, there's different steps in the levels of, mm -hmm. of uh, where you are and where you want to get to. And that's, and it's perfectly fine to be at every step. Yeah. You know? Definitely. I think it's cool seeing everybody's different ideas. Of, sorry. I, yeah, no, you can say um, Seeing, like, because everybody here, you know, obviously is familiar with the machine, familiar with the process, and everybody has a different way that they would toolpath something. Uh, they use a different tool for it. So like just hearing everybody else to be like, no, no, that's we should do it this way. Yeah. There's a thousand ways to skin a cat, and every one of our ways would work. Yeah. Um, it's just would it's work. Cool. Would work. <laughs> <laughs> every one of our ways would work. It's just it's interesting. It's like you know having to be around other people in the shop. Be like, you know, I didn't think of it that way. That's a really good idea. It's a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like what you're saying. I was gonna say earlier we were talking about how you know there there are so many different ways to do things, but I think part of it comes from like how you operate in your shop. Because some people are gonna be cranking out things, batching things out. Um, I know you talked about like you do your topo trays and you batch those out. Um, but when I make stuff, one, that doesn't happen very often because I'm doing support and making videos and all that stuff. But when I do get to, it's usually a one-off of yeah. something. So I'm not worried about tool changes and saving time and things like that. But there are people like you who have this machine and this isn't just a machine, this is like an employee for your business. Because you start it and then you walk off and you're doing something else while this is working on that for you. So that's something, you know, it will pay for itself, but it, it, it is an employee in a way, but it's also, it's, it's kind of dependent on what kind of stuff you're making, what, what you're doing day to day. Exactly, and I'm sure, you know, covering a whole lot of the support, you hear so many different people using this exact machine to do so many different types of things, right? Um, I remember when I first looked into it, I was on the forum and I just saw signs and signs and signs. And um, if anybody's seen my channel, I love making stuff to be able to sell. And I didn't want to sell signs. I don't want to customize things. I want to be able to batch out products. So I'm sure that you've seen a lot of stuff and it's probably opened up your eyes to what can be made with the machine where, you know, I mean, like for me, I, I'm focused on one specific thing and I might not even realize other things people are doing. Yeah. A lot of times it's like, I, I spend a lot of time in the Facebook group and in the forum obviously and uh, I'll see something that I've kind of wanted to do and I can see something, and I can take ideas from other people just looking at how they've done things. Um, but that's what's really cool about this community and this machine is, like you said, there's a million ways to toolpath one different thing. Um, but also there's, there's a million ways to, you know, come up with a new way to do it too. It could be completely different and completely the same all at once. Even down to using the machine, as we saw earlier, like we've been using it, and Layton's been using yeah. the machine a certain it. way. <laughs> Realizing we're probably using it differently to other people, <laughs> yes. but it still works. It, it, right? works. it still works, and that was something I had never thought about someone using yeah. that specific button for that reason. Right. But it did function the way, it, and it's functioned it functioned for like so it works. works. Functioned for years. It, it just <laughs> takes a little longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah we've been doing now it enough. He's good now. Yeah. Gives you yeah. a nice confirmation as well. There's a thing called the manual. No one ever yeah. reads it, but yeah. it probably no, tells. No one reads it. anything. <laughs> That's a testament, though, to the, the simplicity right. of the machine. Is that like you? There's different ways you can yeah. even do the same thing on the machine. Like you just. 
if you're just intuitive, like, okay, I can use this button to do this thing. And that's not the, maybe not be the right way or the way that somebody else would do it, but there's, you know, all, lo all roads lead to Rome, I guess. That, that, that's a good thing about that machine, though, was like, we unboxed it, didn't even look at instructions. Yeah. We went, oh, that goes there, that goes there, and that goes there. It was so And great. it was just put together. Like, we put many machines together for years, different types of machines. And that yeah. one was like an hour, we, hour and a half. We, we were machining stuff within a couple of hours. Yeah. yeah. We literally got it on there. We didn't bother with the spa board. Yeah. We just stuck some wood on there. Turned it on. <laughs> just yeah. Turned yeah. it on. We didn't look right. at any manuals of how to do anything because the interface was like, oh, well, that must be home. That's probably yeah, set, easy, set, right? set zero. Yeah. Yeah. Piece of paper, because we're old school. We still love the piece of paper, mm -hmm. as you've yeah. seen. Um, still seems to work. Um, and that's exactly what we did. You know, it just literally turned it on and was like, oh, that's home. It was just intuitive to use sort of thing. So it's kind of quite cool, really. That, like, I'm very blessed to be in a position where I work closely with them and yeah. beta test stuff. So usually the first person to get whatever they're going to make production oh, comes to me. And I don't get instructions. It's like, like right. they're not made. And they're like, okay, try to break this and tell me what's wrong. And it, for the structure of it, it's always been really easy to put together. Um, but then there's, there's the little incursions intricacies that are like, oh, this may be different, this may be different. What's cool about what you guys can do is you guys can fix software and change software on the fly when you see something yeah. that yeah. people are using or like we did toolpathing today, you're like, oh, this toolpath wouldn't work for this, maybe we can integrate a different toolpath. Mm -hmm. And I can buy something from you now and in a year from now, it has morphed into something even better. Yeah. And I've spent the same amount of money and you know kept getting something better. That's a, that's, that's a cool deal for software. That's why it's good to do stuff like this because we get like I mean it's great hanging out with you guys and everything, but we get so many like new ideas from meeting people. That the amount of new features that have come from doing stuff like this. Yeah. In the past. Well, um, if you're one guy looking at it, or your software guys are looking at it. Probably the software guys have never even turned on the machine right. on a machine and used it. They just know how to write code. Yeah. So it's like none of this is practical. Here's but the practical thing. They'll like. I mean, I've had a few of them in the workshop. I've showed them how to, how to use the one finity, um, and they'll be doing something, and then they'll be like, "Why is this doing this? Like about the software? Why is this doing this?" And I'm like, "You tell me." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, like, and then they'll they'll see what it's actually doing, and then they'll think, oh, maybe we should change this, yeah. or like, maybe we should make it a bit simpler, or something like. That. Toolpath strategy is always a classic one, right? Because if you watch your and you you've said you've gone past this now, but if you watch your toolpath strategy, sometimes it looks it's like you're yeah. doing letters. It will do a letter, and then it will skip three mm -hmm. letters and do something else. Yeah, always confusing, right? Me. And that always confuses you. Because the look of it is odd, it looks wrong. but mathematically, it's the fastest option for it to do based upon the route it has to take. Mm. But it always looks odd. So even when they see it, they'll look at it and go, wow, yeah, you're right, that does look odd. And then they'll check it all and they're like, but no, it is still the fastest method to do it. Mm. And all software does it, it does a, does a slightly different thing. But, you know, if you expect letters to be written out A, B, C, D, E, and it goes A, E, F, B, C, D, it, it looks a little bit odd to the human eye. I, I was actually asking for an option where we could just do it in order. Yeah. Even if it took longer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I really like one. about the, the new Elite machine is yeah. that you get a preview of, right. of you know, um, the end result. Where it just, in, you know, in one line shows you everywhere that the bit yeah. will go. So you see the whole picture. Okay. Um, so you don't see, you know, just in order, skipping three letters, you see the whole end result um, where the bit will travel. So that's, that's a nice... We're really excited by yeah. this machine. Yeah. Like, we can't wait to get our hands on one of these machines. Because it looks cool. The yeah. controller <laughs> looks amazing. Yeah. Like, so I assume you guys have had a good play with it and had a, had a good just chance a to, to, <laughs> to, to, to... Yeah. And have a good play with it's it. It's pretty fun. Yeah? Yeah. So, it, I mean, yeah. obviously, it's... It's the same system mechanically. Yeah. Everything, the ball screws are the same. Um, obviously, our X rails are always the 50 millimeter tubes yeah. on the X50. But the Elite series is going to be the you know the bigger foreman is available, so you can get it in a four x four. But it comes with the Masso controller with the anti skip closed loop steppers. Yeah. Um, and it, there's just there's so many different things, and it's so much smarter and more intuitive. 
that it's just it just really opens things up. Every time I booted it up and I thought I knew what I was doing, I found another feature where I'm like, oh man, this is crazy. This is like I I found parking the other day. We're like, when, once once a cut's it. done, yeah, I don't I have to get the joy pad or whatever. I, I showed y'all over here how how parking was working, and I I can make it go to the same spot every time. So there's just it's not like that one does anything less no. than this one. They both get you to, from A to B. Yeah. But they're it's. It's kind of like a user get you if you get the cheaper one and you you get to know what the limits are. You don't know what the limits are until you use what you yeah. what you know. And that's probably the way it is with like car, yeah, you know, exactly. with car where you it's have like the maker, the maker plus, and so forth. It's a Chevrolet and a Cadillac. Yeah. You know, one they're both going to do the same thing. They're all the same. You know, it's going to get you the same places, yeah. but one of them it's going to do it in style and yeah. luxury. So, so that, real quick before, like, um, I just wanted. to... Do you want to maybe shut that screen off because it might look weird at just uh, flashing colors? So I had to turn this off because it was humming and I know that the mics uh, would pick it up so it's just been flashing behind his head. Yeah, <laughs> so like before we got further into it, I just wanted to... See, that might, when Infinity cool. support, you just click something. I, I've got to ask you later what you did because... I pressed the power button. Oh, I just... I didn't even know there were power buttons on the side. <laughs> <laughs> this, 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 like, I wish I hadn't hit the limitations on the screen. <laughs> So everybody, everybody out there who's been hearing about you know these people who know what this machine is and all the capabilities, when I first saw it, I thought that looks really cool, and I started reading, and I thought that sounds very, very confusing. As somebody whose first CNC was this X50 Journeyman. I had a steep learning curve. That learning curve is based in the software, in my opinion. So Layton's voice guided me hours and hours and hours of my life to the point where I could, you know, cut out simple things. And I've grown to where I'm fairly comfortable with this machine. So when this one showed up, it was just all over again. It was like Groundhog Day. I was like, oh crap, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, and I've got to say, like, from the bottom of my heart, like, it's easy. Um, and, it, and when they say like it's smart and can do all these things and say words like parking that some of y'all might not know what that means out there, like it's all very useful features and I'm very excited about building content around it. And it might seem like it's not really getting any use. Um, we are bringing this to the conference so it's, it's going to be fully set up in just a few weeks and I'm going to start pumping some stuff out. But if you're listening to this and you're hearing a lot of people who know a ton more than me about what's going on and thinking it's just like overly confusing, it is very approachable from the hobbyist level. Just throwing that out there. I mean, watching you earlier though, I mean, Leighton's been doing this for like 20 years, a long time. You went head to head against Leighton and you getting on that machine and using it was like you've been doing it for 20 years. Yeah. Like just, yeah, you just that. got on that, did everything you needed to do, made that Xbox controller look incredible. <laughs> like Leighton could use just, that controller, right? Like just shows that the, the yeah. a lot of the features don't really matter. Like right. every tool is a hammer. Well, yeah. you used it the way you needed to use it, mm -hmm. and all the extra stuff you may never use, and it wasn't built for you. And the software could be changed to take that out or put something else new in. Just like you guys could do the same thing. Yeah. So that just it's just the you know how much do you, are you willing to learn? How much time do you have? Or is this tool working the way I want it to work? And that's as good as the tool needs to be. And I think that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. And the, um, the excitement for us over this one was like that dragon resin carve that Leighton did with the 14 pores. That was so cool. He had stickers <laughs> all over the machine going, do not home, do not, do home. not home, do not home. <laughs> like everything was everywhere. It was like, do not home, everywhere. Back to see, right? Right? We're not, not going to have that issue now. right? Yeah. And we didn't It'll, really have an issue, no, but it so was just different people using our machine. If you pull the power or if it gets stalled or whatever, it'll remember exactly where that happens. Oh, so it'll right. tell you that you're online, whatever. And then I can turn the machine off, turn it back on, home it, and it'll still remember you're at line oh, X, Y, Z. So I'll go, I'll, there's a function start from line. So you type in whatever your line number is, you press start from line, and it will start you exactly where it messed up. So you can go back a few lines if you, you know, got off or whatever. So it can yeah. correct anything like that. So it's really, really That's intuitive right. and smart. I mean, so for, for for those doing resin pours, yeah, like okay. you're you're cutting and you're pouring on the bed. Yes. Right. So that's that's great. And then you're doing your next cut and your next cut. Mm -hmm. So for that, but there's so many other cases where like even a 3D carve where you've got to turn yeah. it off overnight. Yeah. You've done a roughing carve, and then like you're like, whoa, it's taking 12 hours to rough. It's going to take me 18 hours or nine hours, whatever, to finish. 
that's going to give people a better opportunity to not have to like think, oh, what happens if I get a power outage? You know, what happens, you know, if there's a problem? Like, yeah, because no matter what, it's yeah. going right, right back it's always to going back to there. Yeah. And we've had no end of times where we've done 3D carves and there's been something, the machine, there's a, the power's gone out or something like that. Yeah, and on a 3D carve, you're having to like, you know, try and go back, get it to the right place, up and down, up and, and you do a 3D carve, it can really mess the design, like yeah. really mess the design up, right? So the first like week or two that I had the machine, um, we got the first one, Mark put his first one together, sent me one, um, and I had it working. I was doing a 3D test carve, and the machine stalled like five, 10 minutes into this carve. And I was like, you know, we're just gonna, we're just gonna see. So I got on their uh, website and I looked up, you know, going to start from line, kind of looking at that. And I went back like to 10 lines from before where it had started. I punched in my line, pressed go, um, and it started up and it finished the carb and it was perfect. Nice. You couldn't tell that it had ever done anything wrong. So, But these are features you don't know you need. Right, yeah, until you, you, you need them. It. Like how many years have you done this until you did your first yeah. multi-layer epoxy pour 30, you know, 20 yeah. years later? Ooh, now I know that's a feature I would love to have yeah. in a machine. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things like if, if you're new to CNC, just Get one and start going. Yeah. Oh yeah, you know. Oh, what I, mean? I, I like whenever I see, um, like, I've just got my new machine. Um, I'm doing a spar board and I'm putting all these inserts in and everything, and I'm doing this and that. I'm printing all this stuff, and like, and I'm just thinking, just put some wood on the machine and cut yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people get stuck. Like they set up their machine and they'll they'll like, okay, I bought all the extras that ever that I've read that I need to have right. by all the mm -hmm. people who know what they're doing, who yeah. are, at least have been in it for a while and know the things yeah. that work for them. But I always tell people, yeah shoot some brads into your waste board because it's yeah. waste board and just see if it'll cut something yeah. and then i need to remember this but feel that magical moment where you watch a machine do what you told yeah. it to and you're not touching it like, and also don't cut a huge 3d piece <laughs> cut, a square. Square. cut a square cut a square, cut a square. Cut a square. yeah yeah i always have to tell people like as a, a support thing you know people will email in and say hey do you have like a test file to test the machine or uh, a wasteboard file and the best advice i can give is if you're wanting to make a file and you're learning how to do that make your wasteboard file it's a square it's not going to yeah. get any more simple and you're taking off you know minimal material but if you can't do that then you don't need to be doing other things. You need yeah. to learn the yeah. basics and you need to start there and then you know you can add on to your machine and add accessories and things like yeah. that. But if you can't do the basics, there's no point. So you just you start small and then you work up. So like you said, everything that thing does that you can do the same things with this, maybe not as fluidly or as without without as much effort, but but it's the the little things and yeah. being able to do those because if you're not doing those it's not gonna matter if you have the Ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars machine. Yeah, I think that's one of the one of the things that I see the most is people trying to run before they can walk. In pursuit of wanting to make good videos, I'll just get like really ambitious and try things that I have no business yeah. trying, if I'm being honest. Um, and I'll mess one up, and then I'll, ch I'll figure out what I did wrong, and I'll mess up another one. But um, you know, eventually I'll get it. And what breaks my heart is. I hear people tell me like, oh, I bought one and it's been in the box for two years. Yeah. I haven't put it together. I'm like, just, it's How so How get somebody easy over to... that intimidation yeah. hump of like, well, I, I know I wanted one and I know I wanted the outcome, but I don't know, uh, I was, that, that hump of like, this is too intimidating, I don't know. And I would say like, setting it up and, and just attempting the first carb, not worrying about the overload of tram and wasteboard yeah. and stuff, just, just cut something. Every failure is going to be a success later on because that's that is the tools in your toolbox. You like I know exactly what not to do next time, and the more what I don't you know what I don't need to do again is the more you're closer to success where I know what I need to do, and that's that's the point. Yeah, it's a it is a bummer when it's yeah. like yeah I've had one. For I you. know it's such a drag. I, he I heard a this is quote I can't remember where I heard it from, but somebody said like my. My philosophy on life is bite off more than you can chew, than eat like hell. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that approach. <laughs> just put the thing together. Ben just reminded me of a, a bit of a joke that we have uh, in the workshop. Um, basically, when whenever I go on Facebook and someone's got a problem, 
Vad det var. Ah, machine needs cramming. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't be like anything. <laughs> but do, do you want to know something funny internally amongst us? Yeah. We've never trammed a single machine. I, I think I've never, tra- tra- never trammed one. I have never trammed no, a machine. Never trammed a machine. I've done it never once an axis, and it was because the, the head was Never trammed a machine. <laughs> never never done a single machine. I think machine. I've trammed a Z-slider once, but that was it. Yeah? yeah. Because there's not really any point. Yeah. I mean, I, it cleans I don't think anymore. Yeah, and if you're not running like a machine shop or something, yeah. you don't need tolerances that are less than three thousandths of an inch. Yeah. So, in the workshop, if anything goes wrong, did it could be just anything. Say, we just say, did you tram it? Did you tram it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so if you're listening, tramming is nothing. Don't worry about tramming. Yeah. <laughs> Skip over all that stuff on the Facebook hey, groups. You know, yeah. yeah, what we do is you know different to what everybody sure, else. But sure. we, we've all been using it here successfully yeah. without tramming. Right? I don't know. Hamilton may have been a tramming king, right? Yeah. No. How did you? Yeah, Hamilton. How did you start? And like, yeah, I guess, yeah. I'd really like to know like where your first money was made on that. So. Because for me, it was I saw something cool and I didn't know what I'd make and can I have this? Can I have this to my wife until she finally said, "Do what you want." And I bought it that same day. <laughs> but for you, was it like, hey, that's a tool that will make me money and this is what I'm gonna make? You seem to be a planned guy. Yeah. So I mean, like, I bought that specifically to make. Uh, trays to get into stores because I've been building furniture for a long time. I've been a part of, you know, every, you know, a normal table sale is, you know, five grand. I mean, like I've sold like a $20,000 table and I'm really tired of that. I know it, I know it sounds great people out there. It's really not. Um, it, so like I wanted to really downscale a whole lot of stuff and you can't see it, but there's a very large board in the side of this and I work in the shop all the time and I drop that board on my head and I almost passed out and luckily something else in the shop caught it. And I was like, you know, I just don't want my wife to walk in one day and me just be dead in here over something <laughs> stupid. Uh, so I went out, got myself a CNC machine, and I started making trays. And thankfully, uh, Carveco helped me figure was out this something. This is a catch-all tray. Uh huh. Like uh, this is a video uh-huh. that I've done. So <laughs> I, I didn't know what I was doing at all. You can go onto Carveco's <laughs> YouTube channel, and it'll be a picture. Everything else is like a really nice thumbnail, but there's a picture of a tray. And they made that video because I essentially complained about being like, how the heck do I do this? And Leighton, when he first gets on there, he's like, so this is incredibly simple. And he like, <laughs> starts going through the process step by step. In Sorry, I was about, no, 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 no. <laughs> but it's what I needed. And I, I told my wife, I was like, that video has three times the views than any of the other videos around it because people like me have no clue how to do that. Everybody thinks that CNC machines, the entry is you know, incredibly hard to get over, but it's this software. And you just have to pick one and you have to learn it. No one can do it for you, you just have to learn it, right? And without, I mean, like, without your help specifically, I would not be doing this anymore um, because it's, it's so intimidating. So Leighton, for 30 minutes, walked literally a child through the process and then I took that and that made me money for an entire year. Um, I don't often talk about it too much because I talk about my YouTube channel and the money that it generates. <laughs> but I mean like, you want. like those, uh, honestly, I mean like those, those trays uh, paid my bills for a year. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do that without somebody taking the time to very slowly walk me through the process. I get really frustrated with people, but he's very good at tutorial type stuff. But you took what I showed you to do and then you expanded on that, didn't you? You didn't just yep. do the same thing. And I couldn't figure out how to do what I wanted, so I once again bugged CarveCo until somebody found something that works in the program. There's, there's no button that says this is how you do this. And, uh, and I said, please don't tell anybody this because this is going to make me money. And they said, cool. you know. And I used that for a very long time, and two weeks ago somebody started producing that exact same project, so that video will be out soon. Uh, but, <laughs> but I mean, like, it's, it's easy. Somebody like me who is very used to traditional woodworking, you know, sharp tool goes fast, cuts wood, uh, you can get into a place where you can, the majority of the work that you're doing is on the computer. And then everybody else around says, oh, well, you're not doing anything. The CNC is doing the work. And you're sitting there being like, yep, you didn't see me there 10 hours at that computer just clicking little tiny lines, you know, and putting in numbers that don't make any sense. Um, and it's easy to get there. You just have to spend the time doing it, you know. That's the kind of the double-edged sword, though, with, with CNC is like, you know, you make a 5000 or $20,000 table. Not everybody can do that. That requires a lot of skill and a yeah. long time to learn how to do that. 
Whereas C and C, mm -hmm. somebody can somebody can download a file for for five bucks or just. You know, when their friends will share it with them, they put it in the machine, and suddenly they're you. So I disagree yeah. with that. Uh, and so, like, I, I understand your thought process, but like, when I look around at the other tools in the shop, I think any Joe Schmo can go out and buy that and know how to use that in an afternoon. Um, and sure, like, like there's a lot of skill based in things. All the people out there who just got mad, okay. Um, but but I, I don't think there are as many people out there taking the leap to buy a CNC machine to put in the time and effort to actually do this because I mean like people in the comments all the time are like oh if I had a $10,000 machine I'd be doing that too and I respond and I'm like bro it's like a quarter of that you know like like it's the same price as my tables off you know like like that that's where people don't really understand how accessible this technology is for individuals to be able to completely transform your life and make it to the point where, you know, I work four days a week, I spend one full day a week, you know, just hanging out with my daughter because I can. And it's because of these machines that allow me to do that. You know, they're employees, they don't complain, they don't ask for raises, you know, I mean, they do exactly what they're told, even if I tell them to do the wrong thing and they mess up, they do exactly what they're told. Uh, so I feel that like, if you put in the investment for a CNC machine, like you are setting yourself apart way more than you think and just because you're on these forums and you see all these other people making the same object just a little bit different, and you think, oh, the market's flooded. It is not. <laughs> it is not. The, the amount of people out there with CNC machines is so small. You're just, you're just interested in it, so you're flooding yourself with these people, and you're living in a little bubble when in reality, the normal person will never even understand what this is. Yeah. It's like say and say a lot. What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. well, like, like we were saying before, like, you, you, you can talk about you can do something like one of those capsule trays, but then you expand to do something bigger, and then you can do something different, and you can do so many different things on these things, mm -hmm. from you know one-off jobs through to doing like some small mass production type of, of runs and things like that, because the machine will just keep churning the same thing out over and over again, what you tell it to do, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you can take a very simple sign, or you can do a really complex sign, or you know, you can start to, to do more complex designs and work your way through, and that's kind of the cool thing with these. You know, the machines and the software together. We've seen so many different industries over the years with one of these machines doing so many different cool things that you just you just so couldn't believe what they've done. Stuff that you you would see, especially the more like manufacturing sort mm. of things, where you would think they use the CNC to do that. Like, um, for instance, I was I was doing some training at my previous job. Uh, for a company who do refrigeration, um, like they do sheet metal for it, and it's um, it's like you know when you go to the supermarket, you know the refrigerated oil. Yeah. It's all made there but on the CNC. Huh. But things like that, you would think that that was just bended sheet metal. But, you know, yeah. It's all done on the CNC. <laughs> Interesting. Just there's so many things like cladding. Like, do you guys have like? Um, ACM over it, like, so you got, but you know, like the cladding, the aluminium cladding with the plastic in the middle. Exciting. Aluminium. Yeah, it's oh, like I actually exciting. have a sheet in the garage. I know what you're yeah, talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. So all the that's done on the CNC. Mm -hmm. like, it's all done. Cuts on the CNC. It's all barcoded. It's all stacked up on the building site, mm -hmm. and then whoever's fitting it, they come along, pick it up, put it on the plan, and the whole building's. From the scenes, but. Hmm. And it's also interesting too because I mean like as hobbyist you're not only the designer but you're also the machine operator yeah. mm -hmm. and if you want to translate that into a job for a bigger company and you you know yeah. you you know fairly intimately know a program like Carvco yeah. you can turn that into an indispensable job for a company because no one else is going to take the time to learn yeah. that and you know this thing that can translate into a lot of money because people don't want to figure out how to do it. I mean, it's it, it's like, like I, I mean, I've used like small machines, and I've also used machines that are like longer than this shop. <laughs> but it's all essentially the same. Hmm. You know, they've got three axes, the move, the X, Y, and Z. It's the same. Interesting. The yeah. really the only limitation I've seen on any CNC, that being a router or a laser or a three D printer, is my mind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. And, and my mind only goes so far. When, when, it's really cool when we all get together. Like you were mentioning uh, doing a bust of someone, and instead of doing it out of one piece of material, 
you were doing layers. Yeah. And I've never considered, oh, I'll do a layer and a layer and a layer and a layer and go as big as I want to go. Yeah. I've always thought this one dimensional, and that was my mind limiting me. So there could be someone out there that lofty goals, and how do you rein, you know, the uh, reverse. Yeah. How do you rein that into actually a practical thing? Um, and it, like with the Onefinity, uh, turning on its side, it's really the first CNC that I saw yeah. mounting to a wall. That's yeah. like, I've had a CNC for four years, and I've never thought about it turning on a wall and save space. My old <laughs> shop, that would have been amazing. <laughs> the new shop is not so much a big, a big deal. So like that, that kind of limitation of your mind, and uh, but, but meeting other people who like to make, and even oh, yeah. if they're not a person who uses the machine, but they're just a good maker, or they're you know an outside the box thinker, uh, they can give you some information. And be like, oh, you know what? I think I could, I think I could figure out a way to make that work on a machine to come out with something different. So earlier, when Morgan was suggesting um, doing the inverse of the stamps, we thought, well, similar to screen printing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, maybe yeah. Rob looked at each other. So we were like, "That's a great that's idea." Really like, <laughs> stamp, stamp, stamp with a jig. That yeah. idea is oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, right. yeah, that would be yeah, that's yeah. quality. That'd be fun. And yeah. it's, and like I've, I've never, and like Ben was saying, like I've never done anything like that. But I know that this machine is capable, and that yeah. there is a way to do it. Just gotta play yeah. around with it. That's what I love to hear. I love to hear an idea and be like. Yeah. I've never cut that, but I know exactly how I would do that. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've thought about it in my head, and when I can do it, I can do it later. That, that'll be cool. And we all know when, when you mentioned it, we're like, we can do that on that yeah. machine. We could quite easily. Yeah. Like, we know we have to, like, it, it's, it was so cool. Mm. Our eyes just lit up, like, yeah, we could. That was what, when I was saying earlier about seeing the, um, that epoxy stuff on YouTube, and I thought, that's, that's easy. Well, I could do that. Well, you look at the end result and you're thinking, wow, that's amazing, yeah, I could never make something. Amazing. But then if you see the process or you think the process through, you're like, oh, it's literally the yeah. same tool path yeah. over and over. There is nothing yeah. special about it. Now, <laughs> it, there's something special about it, but the there's nothing product, special yeah. about the, the, the formula to make it. Is it. It's just a repetitive and I think process. that's where people get caught up because they see the someone make the final, final product. Yeah. And that dragon you did all those different, yeah. it was insane. It, it looks like it would have, I mean, obviously it took a long time. <laughs> yeah, my first thought was, oh, I can never make something like it's that. It's not even, everyone can it's, the yeah. time. Yeah. it's the, everybody just assumes it's difficult yeah. because it looks complex. Yeah. But when you really break it down and you say, okay, well, I've got you see, like 14 colors, you break it down to those 14 toolpaths. Well, they're just pockets. It's just yeah. the sun. And you're just surfacing yeah. over it and over it. And it's really not hard, but when you really break it down and, and and you kind of dissect it, you realize it's not as intimidating as everyone thinks it is. But before you take the time to sit down with your software and say, okay, I need to do this and this and this, you don't have a clue, so you just assume it's going to be a nightmare. The hardest part is figuring it out in your head mm -hmm. before doing it. And trial and error. Colors of one. Right? Trial and error. Same with any project you do. Like what stain, what finish, yeah. mm -hmm. like what what's going to stop resin sinking in, what's going to stop that's, paint bleeding, like same with all of these things. Like what's like we've all been there, right? That's the hardest thing for me because like going back to what you were talking about, Hamilton and Morgan, um, the hardest part for me is that I'm not a woodworker, hmm. so I come from a completely different sorry. <laughs> I mean spit on you. <laughs> from a completely different background so I was trained as uh, basically I worked in a machine shop hmm. um, so I'm used to cutting metal yeah um, not wood it's very different so, <laughs> very. so I've done that for years like probably until the last years I'm not gonna say but yeah I've done it for years and then um, and then I got into like wood and everything and hmm. doing that but finishing Things like that, I have no idea. That's yeah. the hardest part. So, I mean, me and Rob, we've tried out so many different finishes. If you would, I mean, this is what you see on, on Facebook as well. You just see the finished product. Right. Uh -huh. like, you don't see all the failed attempts and everything. I mean, I, we've got a skip full of junk. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you don't see all those failed attempts. But that's yeah. fun, right? Some of the failed attempts and the learning. Mm -hmm. Like we've been doing this a long time, yet we're still learning new stuff from like you guys from trial and error yeah. every single day. You know, even cutting today, like the trial and error, and just, just like you said before, just get on, have a go, do something. It's kind of
kind of a nice thing to do because like, oh, well that failed I'll have a go at doing something different oh, I'll do a test piece I'll do a bit of this like that's that's the perfect way to learn with any of these things mm -hmm. but you didn't waste an entire afternoon on that first failure right it only took a few minutes yeah <laughs> that's, that, that's true it took it took four minutes yeah and we watched it and we're like, oh, maybe we should, like, that was the cool thing. It was yeah. like four minutes of the machine doing it for you to understand. It is, it is horrible, though, when you spend hours and hours on something. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. yeah. That's I just, last yeah. minute. Just, yeah. <laughs> I, did, I did that, like, a couple weeks ago, I made my first wood inlay. And I messed mm. up on the last step. And this, it's a kind of involved process. In the last step, I screwed up. Yeah, it's pretty hard. So, <laughs> so, I, I always say people, the first project is a wooden inlay. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> You're jumping right in. I else. still have not done one to this day. Oh, we haven't. Yeah, it's, like, it's hard. I've, I've never done one. Never done one. It's, it's all because of like whether you're using our software or some other software. <laughs> <laughs> it's all because of that start depth on the, on the mail. Mm -hmm. like, it's just like, and trying to get it in your mind, it's, it, it's basically you've got the V. Mm -hmm. And then because of the start depth, because it comes down, that's what determines how much is being taken off that edge so it fits. Yeah. And it's just like, it's so confusing, like, to, to actually put it yeah. out, to actually, like... I still don't understand how the values work. Yeah. Like, why they work. They, yeah. I mean, I put it in and it worked. I don't know, but I don't understand why. Yeah, but we never just, saw VBIT v inlays for years. Yeah, like, that is. wasn't a thing. Well, yeah. that's why we've got, in the software, we've got an inlay tool path. And a lot of our customers will go to the inlay tool path to do VBIT inlays, mm -hmm. but it's not for that. Mm -hmm. It's for the sign making industry. Mm -hmm. So they want, like, you know, you've got the sign there. Like the, I'll put uh, it up on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you know you've got the, the acrylic uh, corners there. Mm -hmm. So if you were to fit that in there with you know, square edges, it's not going to fit. Mm -hmm. So our inlay tool path, it would round mm -hmm. the corners. So it would fit. Yeah. But we have people using V bits with that yeah. and they get rounded corners and stuff, so it doesn't work. So you need to use something different to do V bit inlays. So that, it just gets really confusing. Yeah. Because yeah. they were something we haven't seen for years. Yeah, we, like I, we'd never seen it. Yeah. 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 And then it just it's become a thing. And they look amazing. Like when you see the intricate detail on them. But it's it's a project like after you've been using it for you yeah, know you've got used first. to like pocketing and like cutting things out and you know all those sorts of basic things. That's I think that's when you get to that sort of project. I see it's so cool. many people doing that as a first project. Yes. And the problem Why? is like the wood. It's ambitious. Why? It really is. Yeah, two yeah. bits of wood making it and fit together perfectly. Uh, not even not even using MDF to get it to fit. They're using some really expensive wood, really <laughs> nice wood, and they're yeah. like, oh, it's scrapped. Oh, and the, but then there's that like. When you come out with that, it's too nice to use as a cutting board. Yeah, so now it's just a piece to bar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that is where like you know experience comes into play there because yeah. like you can have all of your, the settings right in terms of your start depth and your flat depth and do how everything is, but then if your feeds and your speeds yeah. are tearing your you know yeah. tearing your design out, it may fit, but it's not you're gonna have a bunch yeah. of gaps. It's not gonna look good. So like that's where just experience and know how will, will get you to you know make good yeah. wood inlays, but. Um, yeah, it, it is. It is cool that the software has that ability to basically figure all that out for you. Yeah. It's uh, it's been like such a blessing. Like, and I think everybody here has like even learned something just today of like a different way to think about things. And I think that the internet and YouTube, you know, just to to name a little bit, it's just like seeing other people and how they make things like automatically inspire you. Because like all of us here are makers in different ways. And when you get together, you automatically are like, oh, I will do that a little bit different. And like most people out there, you know, in the CNC world, like they don't have those people physically around them. So, you know, you don't have people to bounce ideas off of. And I've talked to all of these people, you know, so much online and we condense so much of that just in a morning of being able to like unlock things for the CNC, you learning things, me learning things that are super simple to old stone over here that he does every single day that I've probably wasted hours of my life, you know, going through extra steps that I don't need to. And I think it's like such a valuable part of the maker community to be able to talk to each other and learn and share ideas instead of just holding on to it like some sort of like trade secret because the more we learn together, the more it evolves and the more that we can create, you know what I mean? Like 
incredible software and then being like, well, we just saw this new thing pop up, you know, a few years ago that like we wouldn't have, you know, considered before because somebody out there, you know, decided to do it. And now it's like a seemingly standard yeah. for a CNC machine yeah. to be like, this will be my first project. It's, <laughs> it's so interesting, like how like the learning curve really goes for people and what people find as a standard that used to be just incredibly lofty goals, you know, unimaginable things. I can't imagine what it'll be like in 10 years. Well, I, I feel like these machines are going to be in every home. Or I feel like we're, we're in a place where we should have them. Mm. Like a 3D printer, getting out of the CNC router, but like a 3D printer is just too practical and too cheap nowadays, like a, a microwave used to be. It was probably, oh, only a few people have them, but now every house has a microwave. And, uh, you know, these machines now are just so, so good and inexpensive that it's almost like, why wouldn't you have one? Because it's quicker and faster than going out and buying one or, or you know, you didn't make it exactly the way you want it to, to, to work with whatever you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And so I just, that's how, that's my firm belief is we will be there at home manufacturing will be a very normal thing. Within 10 years, I definitely think so. And I think 3D printers are so, they're, yeah, you're right. They're, they're so accessible, they're so cheap, they're so easy to use. And I think that the, the, um, the barrier to entry with 3D printing is just people not knowing how to model stuff. Yeah. Like modeling things that there's, Scale. That hasn't that hasn't become as normalized yet. As well, I think it's like keyboarding. When I was a kid, my mom forced me to take keyboarding on a computer, and I'm like, why would I ever do this? Blah, blah. Yeah. And now it's like well, I can type with my eyes closed. Thank goodness my mother made me do it. But like starting, I'm seeing a lot of Tinkercad. You've heard of that, which yeah. is like super dumbed down stuff. And uh, I've seen that teach in like third grade. So we can start moving in, you know, fifth grade, let's do some real modeling with some real software like yeah. Carco and so forth. And I think that should be like a standard for schools now because it's just too practical. But it's lowering the barrier of entry. Like, yeah. like I, I use shape, the only modeling software that I really use or know how to use is Shape of 3D. It's like, I do it on my iPad. And it's just so easy to learn. Like, and that wasn't, that wasn't around five years ago. Um, and so five years from now, there's going to be an even easier way to do it. And it's going to be more normalized and, and a lot more people are going to understand how to model things. And then 3D printers are going to be a much bigger of a thing. Well, where did Carco start to like, I'm sure it's morphed into something totally different now than it was yeah. like, previous. What, did, it, was so, it, did it start for more industrial things? And now yeah, so it's hobby is so... If you, widespread. If you, the way that you talk inside ten years, like it's gonna, you know, everybody's gonna be into sort of manufacturing things. Ten years ago, there was no machines for like, you know, hobby markets or anything. If the word it was, it was mainly people doing DIY machines, wasn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, there was people making, making their own. own right? like, I've seen like MDF machines and. Because like, machines were expensive. Yeah, they were so like, expensive. really expensive. And like, only. Quite large. I mean, there was a, a place that I used to work. Uh, we did have the same sort of. It was smaller than this. Um, I think it was about do this in in American. I think it was about three foot square. <laughs> um, so it was a it was a meter. It was a meter bed, um, and that was sold for. I think it was about twenty thousand pounds. <laughs> yeah, that's expensive. And so I can't do standing. what quality and everything. What you get in here yeah. is yeah. way, way superior. So ten years ago, we never saw any, no. and that was like because I mean, do you want to talk about where we sort of evolved from? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were, it, right. yeah. What are we thirty, just over thirty years old. That we've been going so you can imagine what it was like sort of 30 years ago and it's really designed for sort of um engraving markets so like plates for card dies or for like bottle labels for like liquor and things like that so all the intricate stuff you see on liquor labels like that is stuff that's done, done that in. was the first tool wasn't it yeah the shape editor the shape editor so that's in maker plus the shape editor that was basically to do, to do one. liquor bottles. To do, well, to do not just that, but any sort of engraving type of thing, like where it's just a lumpy bumpy. Yeah. So 
It wasn't vectors, right? It wasn't vectors. Vectors weren't right. Yeah, it they weren't what they were or what they are now. It was um, just colours. So it yeah. just raised the height of colours of bitmap images. That was that was pretty much what it did, right? So it would just be a colour, and you just click on it, and it will raise the height. That was like mid nineties. See, that does yeah. sound complex compared to what we're working with now. Right. Oh, my. Yeah, and and that's all it did, pretty much, and it would toolpath them. But in the industry, it was really unique because um, it was a relief-based model. Like it was old school. Like the relief, if you're familiar with reliefs or not, mm -hmm. this goes back like hundreds, thousands of years. It's you know what you see you yeah. go through Italy with the hand carving. It's it's a, a real skill. Now we still see some of those people that do those sorts of things and I had a conversation with one uh, recently and I learned so much and he was talking about the hand sculpting side from him but that's kind of where it sort of came from was the traditional tools that people were doing by hand with the way they were carving things and that's kind of how the software came about. It had like the lumpy bumpy type things on <laughs> so, which was the shape editor and then over years and years and years it's kind of evolved <laughs> And it's kind of grown into different markets from like those engraving like metal plate type things through to customers doing size. But then it was like, oh, well, I, I'm thinking, oh, maybe I want to do pens and, you know, really unique pens. And someone's gone, yeah, we could probably do that. Yeah. And then they've gone, oh, well, you know, I want to do chocolate molds. Yeah, we could do that. Oh, we want to do manhole covers. Yeah, we could do that. Because it's all basically the same sort Tires of thing. Tires as well. Car, Car tires, tires <laughs> trainers, um, you know, sneakers, you know, things like that. It's, the software's been used for so many different things over the years. And, and that's been really interesting to kind of see how it's used. Like TVs, the back of the TVs with all the textures on. Oh, so God, many different things. Fans. And like we've seen over years, like the, the high-end market is still evolves and we still learn so much from it because that's ever growing. You know, with new technologies and the things that they do in with plastics or you know just in manufacturing, we see that that quite a lot change. But also, the hobby maker market has just erupted, especially since COVID. It's just it's just gone so far. Like people wanted something to do, they wanted a hobby, they wanted to learn a skill, they wanted to make some money. They they saw things they wanted, and that we saw that as quite a large change. You know, within the market, and machines become um, more affordable, they become better. Um, and actually, I think it was the right time for this to happen because if you think about like traditional hand carving and wood carvers and things like that, mm. it, it is quite hard. It's, a, it's quite a hard market. The skill, unfortunately, is getting less and less and less for traditional hand carvers. There's hand sculptors in marble, in wood, and things like that. It, it is getting less. So there's not as many people training as what there used to be for those sorts of things. And we always learned some interesting things, like the hardest thing to do as a hand carver, now people may correct me, but we've heard this for quite a while, is that um, it's the what we call the roughing pass, because that's what sets you up. So some people who are, you know, who were traditional hand people, they get the software, they get a machine, and they do the roughing pass, and then they just do the hand finishing, mm. because chunking out the material, um, so we've seen changes like that over the year. You know, not just with wood, but with marble and stone and granite and things, because the hardest impact on your hands is taking out, you know, depths and depths and depths. And the machines, incredible at that. And the roughing pass, as everybody knows here, that's the fast bit. Like that, the machines chunk through yeah. like material. Yeah. You know, there's no skill involved. It just, <laughs> it just gets it out. It just yeah, gets yeah. it out. Right. Yeah. So that's quality. So over the years, we've seen some like some changes, and we've had to stay, you know, up with those sorts of changes. But every single time we've learned, you know, been doing this, say the software's 30 years, I've been doing it over 20 years, hmm. and like I've come here today and I've learned so much in the few hours I've been here. I learn off Leighton every single day, uh, you know, and I trained Leighton. Me too. Um, and I, I still learn. So I've learned off everybody that's around, well. especially in the community. <laughs> and because it's ever evolving, you know, that's the cool thing. Like, I watch your videos, I watch your videos. You know, and I'm always kind of learning stuff. I, I watch Hamilton stuff, it's Christmas stuff, and love those to bits. <laughs> like, the, the designs, the simplicity, and I was like, mm -hmm. they're so good. They're one so thing, good. One thing that I, should, I would say is that um, differences with CNC machines, uh, something that we see is 
the rigidity of various machines because you know we as far as the software is concerned all CNC's well as far as rigidity are exactly the same hmm. um, but you'll have someone who's on a really small machine trying to run it like a huge machine trying to take like you know half an inch cut or something and like just like <laughs> <laughs> Well, so yeah, so uh, so that's the other thing as well. Going back to like um, people trying to run before they can walk, um, don't expect as much from you know. You basically get what you pay for, sort of thing. And you know, if if you are going to buy like a, a really cheap machine from another country. Um, <laughs> Who yeah, shall remain nameless? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait a second. We are another country. <laughs> not, not, not that country. Okay. There's, three country there's three countries in this yeah. room. There's three countries represented here. Yeah. Maybe we should cut this out. <laughs> what do you mean by you people? I start that all the time when I'm shooting stuff and I start getting really opinionated and then I'm like, oh, I can't have this in the video. <laughs> I'm just sad because Rob said he watches everybody's videos except for me. <laughs> Oh, thanks. He's right. learned nothing from you. <laughs> Nobody here watches any support videos. Nobody watches videos my support here. videos. <laughs> Obviously. I just, no, wait, I just missed the one. <laughs> Stone, you have, I, you have no idea how much of your videos I have watched because I'm like, I can't figure something out. I'm like, I know Stone's done a video about this. I, yeah. I have to, like, I've, I've watched a ton of your videos because... Obviously yeah, what a, a day and age that, like back in the day, you would have to read the manual, and yeah. that's where it stopped. Mm -hmm. And now you get five million yeah. people's opinion, which is almost like information overload and yeah. too much. Yep. But you will find the answer if you look for it, because someone put it out. But also, there's no guarantee that the information that you get on the internet is well, correct. Right. Most of it is incorrect. <laughs> so you have to sift through and be, have the discernment to be like, I don't think that didn't, that doesn't sound right. And like, you know. It was like what I was saying earlier about the, the graphics driver. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, oh yeah. There was yeah. tons of posts saying like everything from safe to it to whatever. And like I saw it and because I've been doing it for years, like and I've seen it before. It's like, it's like it looks no. like the graphics card, Better. maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so but all of the other replies were like literally a red herring. Yep, and then people sound so knowledgeable yeah, online. Yeah, if I make it sound as though... Uh, and especially as, like, if you're, if yeah. you're brand new and somebody's like, oh, this is the issue you're having, you're like, oh, it must be. And then if that doesn't fix it, you're like, wow, I'm really bad at this. I just shouldn't do this hobby anymore. Yeah. And that person out on the internet could, you know, essentially be a 12-year-old yeah. who just, you know, jumped on there. Not saying 12-year-olds can't run CNC machines. <laughs> um, but, you know, you never know be allowed who is telling you what to do. <laughs> so, like, yeah. Shouldn't be watching this video. <laughs> you say that, but uh, we've got uh, Annie Stevens. She works with us. She's 16 years old, hmm. and uh, she's got one Finity, and she's killing it with that thing, man. Nice. So, I mean, there's. Oh yeah, so that's some a, some younger ones. Yeah, there's a lot of school. People, yeah, like I mean, schools are getting yeah. STEM programs isn't that, that are starting so this cool? stuff. That's just yeah. you know something they're learning. Like they never knew anything. I wish they would have had something like that when I was in like high school yeah. or middle school, because I would have loved to have yeah. been able to yeah. do this. You know, no, it's, but, it's really cool for me as a father. My kids want to be involved in the thing. That's cool. Now, the other day, my son came home and said, Hey, Dad, he came with a list of things. He said, Here's some things I want 3D printed. <laughs> and I was like, For what? And he's like, Well, I'm going to sell them at school. I'm going to give you 50%. <laughs> so like, he's, he's heard, I guess, been around my, I, I, I want to be a, you know, an oh, entrepreneur. Oh, oh. And here he is, 11, trying that's to do cool. the same thing. Oh, Using the technology at home to make things for his friends. That's cool. that's awesome. And I think that's super that's cool. Really cool. Like, what, yeah. And what brings a family together? Like, it's, it's hard when your kids are 11 and you don't want to watch what they're watching. You, yeah. like, you want to be involved, but it's like some of that stuff is just super boring. <laughs> but like with this, with manufacturing at home, you mm -hmm. know, let's dad, can you laser this? Dad, can we cut this? Dad, can we print this? Right. Like I am as equally invested as he is into that yeah. stuff too. And that's super cool that's to cool. be able to do that at home. Yeah. Yep. And my four year old, ages. my four year old daughter loves being in the shop. Really? Right. Like, I've got, go. I've got some like, you know, noise canceling <laughs> headphones for her and I've got some safety glasses her size. She lo loves being in there while I'm using the robots. Um, and that's, you know, the fact that kids are growing up around this stuff, and they're, they're 
so much more capable. Yeah. 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 Technology and like they they understand. They like, come out being able to turn the iPad on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know? And like and, you know like in all the gestures and stuff. I'm like, how do you know? Like it's just like a. It's almost like it's it's uh, inherent. Like and we got we got stuck on the plane like from this, and I wish my kids would be there. My phone. I was trying to watch a video and I couldn't turn it around. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't I, mean, I couldn't find the switch to do it. I know my kids would have just gone. Yeah, you just go. Yeah. Like yeah. that, I, I couldn't do it. I make yeah, software work. for a living. Yeah, yeah. and I couldn't work screen. it. Out, right? <laughs> I couldn't flip the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you're, you know, you watch them, and once they see you do it once, they remember it. For sure. Yeah, and I get like, I'll, um, you know, once the machine is like homed and it's, it knows its limitations and stuff, I'll give her the the. The controller and let her jog the thing. She loves just jogging the thing around. <laughs> well, she I'm thinks fine. that's amazing. But where are we doing? Our, like, I feel like I'm doing my children a service, being like, you're already. I'm hopefully giving you a leg up into this space that I think will be taking over in ten years. And so, like, you you've already known it. You've seen it. You've grown up around it. It's normal to you, mm -hmm. rather than whoa, what is this thing? It's it's intimidating, and it's cool to just bring them. Like, hey, this hey, watch it cut. For today, so you're used to being around that kind of thing I, and progress. I, I got into these. You never know how to say that I worked in a, like, a machine shop and everything. The reason that I, I'm literally sat here today is because I was the only person where I worked that could turn the computer on. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. There you go. It's, honestly, because I'd use computers like all of my life. Um, you know, from the old ZX Spectrums, Commodore 64s. You know, I had stone, stones yeah. out on this one. <laughs> stone's gone, guys. Stone's gone. <laughs> yeah, so, so as soon as we had that computer, like, I pretty much knew what to do. Like, nobody else there knew how to do it. So I started using it, taught myself how to use Mastercam. Don't know if we can say that, but I taught myself how to yeah, use, use Mastercam. Mastercam. Mm -hmm. um, and then that led to me getting another job and I learned lots of different software and that's how I came into Arcam and then into Kafka just from being able to turn on the computer. Yeah. I talked to a guy a couple months ago that said that he used to write G code with a spreadsheet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What? That's insane. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Um, I can't yeah. figure out how to make a background of a cell one color. Like, how do you write G code with That's with what Excel. people had to do. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it almost, though, like, I, I'm understanding now that I'm more into it. It's almost like when you do math with a calculator, you you know, four times four, and then hit equals in the calculator, you get a number, which is kind of the way a CNC works. Mm -hmm. But if you have to hand do out the, the mathematics, it's just kind of like when you can read the G code. So there is a better understanding. It's kind of, I'm kind of in the opposite now. I'm reverse engineering G-code, yeah. like learning what it all does mm -hmm. to really get an understanding. And I think it's really cool to be like, uh oh, these, these letters and numbers actually do something and this is how it works. And when I click on this button, I can see the G-code in my mind of what that button does. <laughs> You're like the dude in the Matrix that can watch the green <laughs> letters and be like, oh. I'm not, no, by, by far I cannot <laughs> write G-codes. But like, I'm, I'm just at the cusp of like, something's clicking in my mind where the g-code is making sense and I can maybe start writing a very script like do a circle and that's that's it you know what I mean which is pretty cool I think is I, I actually I actually learned before we had a CNC machine and we had to like, <laughs> if you wanted to do like a circle or something to do that on a manual milling machine you either got to be amazing at doing two handles together, uh -huh. <laughs> right. which would be pretty hard, or you had something called a round table. So you put the round table on there, which had a handle that would go around. So you have the same thing with the spindle. Hmm. So you come down, start machining, but you'd have a handle there which would go around. But for every increment, you had to work it out with trigonometry. To create to plot the curve, mm -hmm. so you had to do lots of different maths for each point, mm -hmm. and then you'd go around to the position just to do a curve. Wow, oh, man, your Gary. life's got easy now. I was thankful that you went before me, and I didn't have to do any <laughs> of that. Yeah, there, I had somebody reach out to me on Etsy who said uh, I posted like I made a hot. Usually my Etsy sales are because of something I made for myself, and I'm like, oh, I could just sell this file because I've already made it. Mm -hmm. And one was like a Christmas ornament. My wife likes, she works uh, with kids, and she makes 
Christmas ornaments every year. She takes a picture of them, puts it on an ornament, and so they get sure. to do a craft together. And I posted this Christmas ornament, simple shape. It was just the outline of an ornament. Mm -hmm. I mean, it couldn't be more simpler. It's almost just a circle. And I had somebody contact me saying, can you make a little bit, like, they gave kind of a shape. And I was like, sure. And they're like, we have a CNC. We don't make G-code for it at all. We, we cannot design it. We have a 5 by 10 machine. This is our full-time job, but all we do is cut circles. Oh, That's no. all they do I've seen is that. cut circles. And I was like, "Are you? how do you have a machine that's thousands of dollars more than mine and have no idea how to drive it? It's almost like having a limo and you just have a driver driving it. So it's, but, but learning that is like, there are two sides of this. There is learning the software and learning how to use the machine. And if you're good at one and not good at the other, you can make a full-time job of yeah. They obviously had a full-time job of just running their machine, yeah. and they subbed out the work to somebody who's good at making G-code yeah. or you know, and designing in your, in your software, and that could be that full-time yeah. job. And then that person could never touch a machine, yeah. but still be a full-time deal. It's like, um, I went to a place, um, it's probably the same over here in the States, um, but I can remember going to a place to do some training for a company that produced um, signage um, from the roads, um, like motorway signs, so you know the speed limit signs, mm. just big round aluminium circles and that was it, huh. just putting four by eight sheets on the machine, just cutting and just run circles. It. There's another one, it. we have a friend who worked uh, <laughs> at a plant, uh, Eaton, and I think I bought out by Danfoos now, but they make all kinds of hydraulic stuff, and he was a CNC operator. Man had no has no idea how to write code. All he knows is he was given a code by someone, and this is a humongous multinational company, and there are just operators, and that's so all they're doing. Like and I didn't realize coming from the hobby space, I didn't realize I was doing so much yeah. more than what like professionals are doing. Yeah, which is kind of cool. Be like. I can actually program that machine. I, I yeah. went to a place once and they had, uh, do you guys have like, people on like zero hour contracts and stuff? Like, or, like, so they haven't got a contract at work. Like, and basically, like, they're sort of like temporary staff. Yeah, like, yeah, a 1099 like, employee is the yeah. technical. A yeah, contractor. So they have no contract or anything. So or they say they work under the table yeah. is the yeah. term people use. So I, I went to a place that was, had two CNC operators that were like that and they absolutely hated the job right like, and literally they were just pushing a button yeah and that was it mm -hmm. yeah and I was like I was just thinking to myself this CNC can do so much more yeah. it's about it's about as long as this yeah. and they were just pushing a button and like they had a, a design studio which was probably about maybe about 500 yards down the road um, but the guy that was doing it, like designing it, hadn't got a clue about machining. Right, so basically they would push the button, and the one day that I was there, they pushed the button and started machining. They were using compression bits, and they weren't ramping in. <laughs> and they literally set fire to the table, and it was on fire. Yeah. Gosh. And they were like, they were like, what, what, what do we do? Like, because they were getting into trouble, and but they were the ones that were just pressing the button. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what do we do? And I was like, I think, I think, whoever's designed it hasn't hasn't ramped in. And it's just like gone straight down. And that's one of the things we do always say to people, isn't it? Like, you need to ramp in on some of your designs. If you're using compression yeah. bits and you're just thinking you're going to go down like half an inch or an inch to cut and then just go straight into the material. You, but that's you know. something else that comes from experience. Experience is yeah. checking that you'll ramp into the material yeah. to, and it's, to it's go e down. And it's easy to not check it. Yeah. And to just not even realise when there's all these options in front of you. And you just like... Yeah, like what does it do? Let's press that. Let's press yeah. that. The machine probably wasn't trained that day. Yeah. yeah <laughs> but yeah, you know, this, yeah, things like that. Like, there's stuff that... that like you're saying, you know, you're doing more than some people who are, because you've learned it yourself, you've learned to design, you've learned to machine, you can take a circle and you can just change the design because you do it as a hobbyist, you do it as a maker, you do it as somebody who's invested in it, like watching the stuff that, that you do, Hamilton, you know, with your designs and everything like that, 
is fantastic. You know, you're there with like the stuff that you create and how you do it, and it's that's really nice. And that's that is slightly different actually to some of the things we've seen in the past. Like we've seen things like you know, like you said, I've been to places where they've just cut squares. You know, they've just been in cutting square plates out. You know, it could have been done on a table saw sort, of, sort of thing, but they've just cut squares, and that's all they know how to do. So you know, when we see makers who are doing some really cool stuff, designing things. Um, you know, they design it in the software, then they stick it on the machine and do something pretty cool, and then they finish it. Like the one thing I think we've learned more since we've had our own shop itself is the amount of time it is on the machine is minimal compared to everything else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like we'll be probably do like say twenty minutes to an hour designing in the software, and then we'll spend four minutes on the machine like earlier. And we'll spend two hours, yeah. like to three days <laughs> finishing afterwards. The worst. Finishing, right? Sanding and finishing. Maybe. Yeah, we we spend like so. So the learning curve on those sorts of things is, you know. I think I think going back to manufacturing though, of that like manufacturing, it's it, it's basically a lot of places they'll get the same thing, and most of the time it's not exciting. Um, it's just the same thing cut over and Sneeze over and over again. Oh, Point to surface and, sale. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the thing about stuff. makers is, like, a, a lot of the time it will be one-offs, and mm. um, it looks cool. Like a lot, a lot of stuff that's made, it, it will look cool. It's not like a circle or you know just something that's like quite boring. Um, so that's the good thing about like the maker community is that like. I love the stuff. It's, it's just fun. Cool. This kind of makes me feel more valuable now. Mm. Like reflecting <laughs> on the fact that there are massive manufacturing deals just cutting a circle, yeah. Yeah. pushing a button. Yeah. And knowing that, no, it takes like at least two, a designer and the person running the yeah. machine to make whatever they're making. I am both of those people. Yeah. So I am worth more than what I thought I was worth. Yeah. And your value, honestly, is a lot of companies have no idea how to get something made. They might have an idea, but yeah. I mean, like the process of finding a manufacturer, you know, with a minimum order quantity of 10,000, it's just like so out there that I have people contact me just because of my YouTube channel to like make hundreds of things, which I could, but then I wouldn't be able to run a YouTube channel. So I mean, like, like, having the ability to put yourself out there and show, hey, I'm capable of these things or this machine that I have is capable of, of producing this amount of stuff, like the people will show up. They will order stuff from you because most people just have no idea how to even get that started. The amount of individuals out in the world that have small business ideas but only have, you know, a few thousand dollars to start up and that doesn't even touch, you know, the design process for for, for most manufacturers out there like if you want to find those people, put yourself out there, they'll find you. And I mean, like, you are incredibly valuable with these skills that you have because you are operating, you understand that process, but you are designing, which a lot of people really uh, don't appreciate. <laughs> Here's a cool <laughs> example of something that's happening in my life right now where I didn't understand my value, but it's, it's because I'm taking time away from somebody else who, uh, to, to better explain it. I have a friend at church who, uh, he owns a fishing lure company. He, he's designed and makes fishing lures. Well, he, for, you know, for the last 20 or 30 years maybe has made them. He's having to, ha they hand carved out something at some point. Uh, a lot of it goes overseas. Someone has to design that lure for him digitally. Okay. Then it comes back and it goes overseas again to make a negative. Basically, the, like the stamp wow. you're making, yeah. uh, a double-sided deal. To where it's an injection molded type yeah. deal. Well... I got to talking to my church, and he came over to my shop, and he's like, "Look at all these things," and I'm like, and he showed me the mold, and I'm like, "Look at that! I can make it." <laughs> and he's like, "What?" And I said, "I can model the the lure you want, and I can make that." This is taking him thousands of dollars and six months to go from an inception in his head to an actual product he can fish and see if it works. Yeah. And I'm literally doing it in two days. Yeah. yeah. I, and it takes, you know, I, I'm 3D printing the mold because I've learned that I can do it out of ABS and it's quicker like instead of cutting it out of uh, an expensive aluminum part. I could just as easily do it out of the aluminum. Yeah. But I, I mean, it's, it's taking me maybe two hours of my day and, you know, the 3D printer is running for nine hours while I sleep and I wake up to a test part. We can make 20 test molds, change the design, and he has this thing now, which used to take a year. We can have it out in a week. 
And I'm doing that on my shop. I would have never considered, I'm going to make a fishing lure today. Yeah. <laughs> but I just met some guy. I looked at his problem. He said, here's what my process is. And I said, I can do that. And it, and it pushed my design, like I, I was at a place that, in designing anyway, at least 3D, where it was like, I'm good enough to make some circles and some squares and stuff. But doing that pushed my designing skills, pushed myself to be like, I'm going to learn more design skills here, curves and arcs and all those things, to, to be better. So some of the cost of like, he's going to pay me to do this stuff yeah, was yeah. like, I don't, I don't want your money. Mm -hmm. It gave me like something to push myself to make something better. And that, like, that really opened my eyes, like, that's my work. He's spending thousands of dollars. Even if he pays me half, he's extremely happy. And I'm like, whoa, I just got paid a ton of money for something that's super easy for me to do. Well, it's just combining all my skills, you know? I had exactly the same thing once with, uh, it's quite a funny story, this is. I had exactly the same thing once with, um, it was a, hard, a guy who modified Hardy Davidson. Um, and, like, you know the pegs on like yeah. Mm -hmm. He wanted to do those out of um, pigs' trotters. Right. Like got yeah. legs. Yeah, yeah, you know, like pigs' Hoops. feet. Hoops. Hoops. Yeah, yeah. yeah, pigs' trotters. Trotters. Yeah, trotters. trotters. Yeah. wasn't yeah. expected. Yeah. <laughs> we did say they'd be weird. <laughs> <laughs> we're lumping them out. Everyone's like, what? Real yeah. pigs. All over your trainers. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> like, he, he, yeah. he, wanted to, he wanted to basically do a, a, a casting. So he wanted a, a zinc uh, die casting. Oh, okay. Um, so that's what we used to do. We used to make like tools for it. Anyway, so my my boss was like, "Do, do you think that you could model this up?" And I was like, "Yeah." I was just, and I thought, "Hey, what does a pig's trotter look like?" <laughs> <laughs> you always um, thought of a pig as a kid, but you never yeah, like yeah, zoomed yeah, in yeah, on the foot. Yeah, yeah, so, no. so I was like, so, "Anyway, so." So my boss phoned up this guy and he was like, how exactly do you want it to be? Like, can you, could you draw one out for us? Like, like just draw it out, sketch it out and give it to us. Mm. Anyway, it turned up about half an hour later and he'd actually bought a pig's trotter and put it on the desk and he was like, that's what I wanted to look like. And he was expecting me to model it, but we did model it and we did it in the end. <laughs> did you cut it out too? Yeah, and it was the too. whole deal? And now we've got 3D scanning. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh, comparable to that, I mean, this is something that took probably about three, four months or something to do. Then, you know, we had to cut it out of steel, it had to be hardened and everything. We had to do all all the moving parts for the, like the ejectors and everything and like so, mm -hmm. yeah, it took a while. Hmm. 3D scanning's changed though. Oh, over yeah, the years. Well, since you never we've even been doing had it, it then. Yeah, so. it wasn't and then it was just like flatbed 3D scanners and then it was like, you know, hand scanners with big like cables yeah. that went into the computer yeah. to then doing it on your phone. So then doing take lots of photos and it's stitching it together. And we've had some really cool cool examples with some of those where like you know, there's been like old theatres and you know, they've got like one bit which is good there and three bits which are broken off because they've been damaged or something like that. And they've been able to go up and scan it and then bring it into the software, re-sculpt it and model it, and then just replicate what was there. They couldn't get up because I mean they're talking they're high, they're high, you know, in them. And they can't take them away because they're listed buildings, so it has to stay there. And yeah, so they can just scan them, bring it back in, and just replicate exactly right. what's there, and just and just do it. That's incredible. And some stuff like that is it's so cool to do because of the 3D scanners. Mm -hmm. um, and then like you were talking about earlier with the, the 3D busts and stuff, where we've had people yeah. who've done that, and they've made it bigger. They've sliced it, and they've made things bigger. And, and these machines, to, to think about them, when people talk about, oh, my Z's not high enough, your Z's high enough, because your tool's only got a certain length on it, mm -hmm. and you just slice stuff. Like, we haven't had an issue where the Z hasn't been high enough on these machines, because if it's going over a certain bit, if you go for a long reach tool, that, that can break quite mm -hmm. easily. So, you know, slicing stuff to get more Z height and then gluing it's it together, it's when you, quite When common. you got that Z, Z height, it's like you lose so much rigid, rigidity yeah. really yeah. with it. When you got the gantry that high. Yeah. Nice. There's another example, uh, talking about slicing, uh, a guy um, that we follow each other on Instagram, he sent me a message said, hey, can, can you 3D print a uh, something for me? And I was like, sure, yeah, probably. I, I always, whenever somebody comes to me, like, tell me, your, tell me what you want and let me see if I can do it. And that's cool, like, you could turn down jobs because you're like, oh, yeah, I don't want to do that. 
But this was really interesting. There's a Nike, or Nike, depending where you are or who you're from, uh, a dis distribution in Memphis, and he's right outside of Memphis, and he's got a big old workshop. He makes big furniture and all that stuff. They contacted him. They're giving themselves an This is funny. They're giving themselves an award for being open during COVID and shipping Nike stuff. Right. Uh, so they wanted the statue. <laughs> they wanted a statue of Nike, the, the goddess, the actual yeah. with yes. wings off the back. And they wanted this huge, like seven foot, eight foot tall. Or, or maybe, <clears throat> maybe they said, you know, do whatever you want. He came to me and said, what I want to do is take the statue and I want to slice out sections and then put maybe pegs or something. So when you look at it from an angle, it'll look solid, but when you look at it straight on, you're seeing through yeah, the statue. That's cool. And he's like, what I need is, I need to walk in and show them like, here's my example. So he said, can you do something? I'm not great at slicing there, so I reached out to somebody on Instagram and said, hey, can you slice this for me? I, I think you could do that quicker. And he did it for me. And then I, pr I took wood filament and 3D printed the wood filament because he was gonna do it out of wood. I printed all the sections, there was like 78. Wow. To scale, it's about, you know, about yay tall. I sent it to him, he glued it up, and then presents it to him. Then he goes to the CNC, and he literally, t he's got a, a much bigger CNC, I think a four by eight, so we can do it a, a bigger section. And he took the exact file, the STL files we did, put it into his software, and then cut that, sh cut the shape and layered it up, and that ends up being a statue. Cool. Which is like, why am I doing this stuff? This is stuff I never would have thought of, but yeah. I, it's always like, the people who reach out are like, can't, Hey, I have an idea. Can you do whatever? I'm always interested to be like, what's your idea? Because yeah. it's not something I would have ever thought of. And it pushes my boundaries like, hmm, can I do this? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can. How do I put it all together and, and make it happen? Yeah. Which is pretty neat. Yeah, cool. Very cool. Yeah. Let's, let's oh. say who we are and where you can find it, and then I'll put it on the screen too. Oh. All right. I'm Ben Myers. I'm with Myers Woodshop. You can find me at, on Instagram or YouTube at Myers Woodshop. So I'm Rob Newman from Kafka. You can find me on anything Kafka related, typically Ask Kafka, or I do have a personal in Instagram, which I put up things like when I've been here, which is just Rob Newman makes. Very simple. I'm Morgan Hoppensberger, and uh, you can find me on Instagram at Morgan Hopp, and also uh, one youtube.com slash onefinity scene. So you've got a whole series of videos on there. Uh, Hamilton Dilbeck. Uh, you can find me at Hamilton Dilbeck on YouTube. Or our website, cncelater.com. I'm um, Lyson from Carvco. Um, probably hear my voice on lots of... Uh, I'm basically that English guy on the Carvco videos. I'm Stone from Onefinity. Uh, find me on Instagram, Stonefinity, or at Onefinity CNC. Um, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> this right. is what I was talking about. Right. Strong, strong, strong. Thanks for stopping by. See y'all later. Yeah. Bye. 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 <laughs> oh. that, that is exactly that was how it way. Way. <laughs> Once again, I'd like to sincerely express my gratitude for all of these men being able to join me in the shop. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity that I hope turns into a yearly opportunity. Thank you again for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Once again, if you'd like to support the channel, check out the links in the description below. Until next time, see you and see you later.